Moving to Live is a podcast about movement and exercise. We bring you interviews with professionals in the movement and exercise field. The goal is to provide information for other professionals and also amateur movement aficionados, people who understand that movement is part of what makes life complete. Some of the people we interview you will have heard of. They're well known in and outside of the movement and exercise profession. Others you may not have heard of, but they have a great deal of knowledge to share. Many people doing the best work spend their time working with people, not working on their social media presence. We're going to give you a chance to learn from some of these talented and knowledgeable individuals, and we're going to learn along with you. Moving to Live podcasts are going to be short. Each interview will be long enough to impart usable information, but short enough to be able to be consumed in a single bout, during your workout, commute, or even during dinner prep. We all like long-form interviews, but time is valuable. Moving to Live wants to give you the option to learn and be entertained without needing to commit 60 minutes at a time for an interview. Give Moving to Live a listen. Check out our sister podcast, FitLab PGH, which highlights people, businesses, events, and activities in the Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania area that make movement a priority. Moving to Live would love to hear from you. Want to connect with us or have an idea for somebody you think we ought to interview? Drop us an email, mov number 2 liv at gmail.com or connect with us on Instagram and Twitter, both underscore MOV number two LIV. We're excited to bring you these interviews, and we think you'll enjoy each and every one that we bring you. Welcome back to another edition of the Moving to Live podcast, along with our sister podcast, FitLab PGH. We really want to promote the ethos that movement should be treated as a lifestyle, not just an activity. I've mentioned before on both podcasts that sometimes the best guests come from recommendations from past guests. And today, one of the guests that we have is somebody that I interviewed early on, and he said something that really stuck with me, and I've repeated it to numerous people and really tried to practice what he preached. He said he never wanted to be one of those people that somebody contacted, and I'm paraphrasing here, but he essentially blows them off because he just doesn't have time or doesn't think they're important enough. And I think that's really whoever's in the movement field. We are teachers. We're fortunate enough to be back with Rick Howard and his partner in crime, Tony Marino, (laughs) who are very involved in something called long-term athletic development or LTAD. And when I was thinking about who I wanted to interview for podcasts around the Christmas break, as I was thinking for 2020, I realized that there's a lot of lip service to LTAD. There's a lot of websites, blog posts, but if somebody says, what is LTAD? It's really, really difficult to grind down and say, this is what it is. And this is what we're trying to go. I think a lot of professionals say, oh yeah, I want my athletes to play multiple sports or I want kids to be active, but they don't under really understand the background of long-term athletic development. So Rick, Tony, I want to thank you for taking time to join moving to live and hopefully explain in a lot of detail about LTAD. Thank you, Ben. Yeah, Ben, thanks for having us. One of the things I always like to do on Moving to Live is I always like each of my guests, and as I mentioned before we started recording, this is the first time I've had two guests, so I think it'll work smoothly, or at least my fingers are crossed. (laughs) I like to know how people describe themselves. If they meet somebody in an elevator at a conference and they kind of turn over your name tag or somebody sees you in a Starbucks line, and we'll start with you, Tony. Somebody says, hey, you know, what do you do or what's your background? What's your kind of 30-second elevator spiel or coffee shop talk? Uh, I kind of like to think of myself, uh, and I just realized this the other day, I'm a, a pseudo musician. So I try to think of myself as like a punk rocker of movement science, you know, try to think outside the box to uh, initiate change and um, embrace evolution, uh, all for the positive, of course. So that's kind of how I, I, I kind of look at myself as try to be a, a, an engineer or a, 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 a provocateur, if you will, of, uh, uh, thought that will uh, unique thought and, and thought outside the box that will kind of be progressive. And I know I've got the advantage of being able to look at people's bios. They fill out brief bio sheets. And from looking at your bio, it's pretty diverse in what you've done career wise. And just looking at it, I would think if things worked out differently, you could have ended up as a ski bum somewhere in the mountains out West, uh, teaching skiing and working in a fitness facility. Am I wrong there? You've got that. That was the dream job to be honest with you. That, that was my, uh, that was my career path in my early 20s. That's what I wanted to be. And Rick, uh, you and I have known each other for a few years, I think, as far as 
people who are active and move are probably about as far apart as you can get. You like to do strong men thing. I like to do out, go out and uh, do things aerobically, but I think we're both dog lovers. And if I know one of my favorite memories of all my podcasts is the fact that in the podcast I did with you, we have your dogs barking in the background, which is a positive thing to me. Good, because they'll be barking again soon. <laughs> so you see people and they say, what do you do? What's your elevator spiel or, or your Starbucks line answer? That's a great question. And, and the more I've been thinking about how to properly phrase this, a colleague of mine once told me that I was going to be known as the great collaborator. I don't really want credit for things, but I want everybody working together to make things happen. And I've had a really fascinating background. I've taught physical education. I've coached. I've run a fitness center. I've been a personal trainer for a number of years. I've been a college professor. I do a lot of writing. So I think I come from all of the different backgrounds that are necessary to really make this happen. And now that I'm starting to see a lot of groups who are thinking the same thing and everybody's kind of in that mood of collaboration this year. So I'm so excited that uh, you're having us on so we could share that experience. I think it's very interesting and, and is worth of commenting on your comment of a collaborator. There's a gentleman who's not involved in the movement field here in Pittsburgh, Larry Joya, who calls himself a connector. And he mm -hmm. believes in the theory ABCD, always be connecting the dots. It's not who you know, but who you know who knows somebody. So maybe you can help them or maybe you can direct them to the right person. And I think to the things that Larry has said to me and the thing you said when I interviewed the first time is I always want to be able to be known as the person who replied to the email or replied to the phone call and possibly wasn't able to help them, but was able to direct them in the right direction to continue them on their path. Absolutely. That's why you do a podcast too, right? <laughs> I do the podcast partially because of that and partially because when else do I get to geek out and talk to various people for 30, 45, an hour, rather than just seeing them talk with their can talk in a conference. So the next thing we want to kind of cover before we get in more detail, you see it all over the web and it's actually, I forget which NSCA Facebook group it was, but over the weekend, somebody made a post, what do you look for? In a sport or in a performance coach for your child, and immediately I thought, I wonder what long-term athletic development says about this. So, long-term athletic development, Rick, what exactly is it? Where did it come from? Well, it's a great question. Who knows where it really came from? Just like everything else, it's kind of uh, <laughs> one of those indirect constructs that we talk about. It, it's a word that's out there. It's a phrase that out that's out there, but it has so many different meanings to so many different people. And that's why I really enjoy working with Tony and our other colleague, Joe Eisenman, who could not join us today, but is here in spirit. The, I think we've done a really nice job of taking some of the definitions and the formats that are out there for long-term athletic development and tried to create something that's meaningful to people. A lot of these terms really don't connect with people where they are. So that's kind of a, an obscure term. You know, If we went out and said long-term athletic development, everybody let's do it, nobody would know what we were talking about. So we break down the long term. How long is long term? Long term really is cradle to grave. A lot of the models and programs that are out there focus more specifically on youth. Uh, Tony, Joe, and I met actually doing youth work for the NSCA, which created the Long Term Athletic Development Special Interest Group. Uh, athletic is another key element of that. You know, in the United States, especially, we have this notion that an athlete equals elite athlete. But if you're not an elite athlete, you're really not an athlete. So that's where our problem comes in. Because we like the definition that Dan Bowerman from Nike used years ago that, that a lot of other people, Tom Ferry from the Aspen Institute Project play. Everybody's an athlete. So we all have some endeavor with, that we're trying to work on. So, so far we know that everybody's an athlete in the last cradle to grave. So then we have to figure out what the development part is. And that's kind of like we were talking about before. Everybody who's in this movement field, we're either trying to get you to move or to move better. And I really like that because that's exactly what I think we're trying to do here but trying to bring it back to the terms that people can understand. You know, if we tell people to go and move, it doesn't mean anything. And so many people in our field, they get so upset that people aren't actually moving. There's such a small percentage of the population that actively moves. So LTAD, I think, is a framework to get people to move, to do what they need to do, but to meet them at their level to do so. I think one of the things that I really enjoyed hearing you say there is really defining cradle to grave, the fact that it's not just kids, but it's everybody. And I'm thought of a physical therapist I interviewed for this podcast, Jenny Ploss, who's involved with a program called Move Nat, which is just uh, something she mentioned that her 80-some-year-old mother do it. They mother does it. They do 
essentially organized play where they run, they jump, they, they do balance beam stuff. Really a lot of fun stuff, but things that probably most of us as adults don't do. And definitely a lot of children or kids who are playing specific youth sports, they don't do it because, and I'm saying this somewhat tongue in cheek, it's not sports specific. Mm -hmm. True. <laughs> One of the good things with MoveNet too is that they actually have movements that they make it fun. You know, mm -hmm. they do all the different animal movements that we've long forgotten and haven't done in years. So they bring that back because Tony and I will often talk about, you talk about athleticism. Most of the kids now don't have those basic skills that we all had growing up. They can't skip. They can't even run correctly or jog or hop. So anything that's out there that helps to promote movement in a fun, engaging way, we're definitely in support of. And Tony, I was actually thinking about this when I was out running with my dogs earlier today. The idea that there's so many really good athletes out there. You see somebody, you know, we just had the Super Bowl yesterday or a couple of weeks ago. We had the uh, the national title football game in Division One football. There's so many athletes out there that you watch them move. But kind of talk a little bit about how the fact that somebody who is phenomenal or really skilled in a sport may not be meeting that long-term athletic development just for a lifetime of movement. Well, I think a lot of it, as uh, Rick alluded to, you know, starts as youth. Youth is just so critical. You know, the, the movement experiences and the environments that we're exposed to as youth are so critical to what we do uh, later on in adulthood. And as we become older, uh, it's this cradle the grave concept, right? You know, what I, the experiences that I acquire uh, as youth, and which just makes the, the LTAD framework uh, so great, is that Ultimately, there are two pathways. You know, yes, there's going to be that phase in your life if you're an elite or a professional athlete that you are going to perform at a high level. Uh, but then what about What are you going to do after your career? You know, what are you going to do in the years beyond that? Um, what other movement experiences do you have that will enable you to move in other activities um, beyond your athletic experience? But then there are the vast majority of us you know, that are going to follow the framework as a participation pathway. Um, so, you know, when you see these, when I'm watching these Super Bowl athletes and players and things of that nature, um, yes, their careers will end eventually because of an injury or uh, age or, or whatever it might be. Um, hopefully, many of them would have been exposed to experiences that will enable them to continue to move and serve as role models in their communities, whether it be as coaches or administrators as it relates to their sports. So, Again, the framework, what's fantastic about the framework is that it, it creates a, a pathway or a road or a network, if you will, to kind of perpetuate movement throughout the lifespan. It's interesting. The Wall Street Journal every Tuesday has something about somebody who does a unusual movement or fitness activity. And today's uh, article was on a former college football player who his sport is cornhole. And... <laughs> Somebody from the Midwest, and I'm kind of in the Midwest near Pittsburgh, and kind of go, well, I don't really see that as an athletic endeavor. That's something you play at a tailgate or maybe at a backyard uh, barbecue. But he talks about the – there's actually $250,000 of prize money, and he talks about the tournaments that last all day. And it's really an interesting concept of how somebody transitioned from college football to another – maybe it's not my cup of tea or something that I want to do, another movement activity that really is something that I would imagine he can do literally up until the day he dies. Yeah, I mean, cornhole is 21st century horseshoes, right? Exactly. That's essentially, that's essentially what it is. And uh, yeah, any opportunity that, you know, he may still feel this need to, to have competitive drive or, you know, just to, the, the social part of it too. You know, we talk about the physical part of it, but just the fact that you can – socialize with friends and peers and family in, in some type of physical endeavor, again, that's a great piece of that ALTAD uh, framework um, in perpetuating movement in some way, shape, or form. And it just happens to be cornhole in this case. I'm curious, Tony, staying with you for the moment, you, you see so many kids involved in, air quotes, high-level sports at a very young age. I'm, I'm thinking for example, in basketball, where there's kids as young as seven and eight who are playing AAU basketball, travel sport basketball, they've got their own skills coach. How does that fit in with the long-term athletic development model? Or is it something that's kind of the long-term athletic development model needs to break in and educate some of these skills coaches and some of these basketball coaches to say, hey, we can help your athletes not only now, but five years down the line, 10 years down the line, 25 years down the line. 
Right. That's a great question. And it's very, very complex. You know, when we look at uh, elitism at a very, very early age and the belief that these athletes are going to actually track into becoming elite athletes at a professional level is, is unfounded, uh, first of all. Um, second of all, when we create an infrastructure where we begin to separate or specialize or disengage kids from the flock, um, we really are setting up a delusional idea that a lot of these kids really are, um, they're not learning any other movements or skills or attributes. You know, I, I, what the ALTAD framework does is it looks at sport as uh, the opportunity to participate in many movement experiences, in many environments, and in many contexts. So again, if as a result of growth and maturation, taking basketball, for example, I don't grow up to be six feet four or six feet five or six feet six. What can I do if I'm only five feet 10? Well, maybe I could have been a great lacrosse player or maybe I could have been a defensive back in football or a second baseman in baseball. So I think when we track kids at an early age to, to specialize or participate in very limited movement experiences, what we could be doing by default is eliminating them uh, from movement experiences into adolescence, into adulthood because they're not going to have that buffet of movement experience or competence and confidence to continue in other activities later on in life. So um, the ALTAD framework is a, is a very um, loose structure that really encourages uh, exposure to multiple movement experiences in multiple environments. And Rick, I'm interested in hearing about how the ALTAD framework can be involved with youth sports, because one of the common things, I, I don't have kids, I just have dogs, but one of the common things you see with uh, friends of mine who have kids and friends of friends who have kids is, you know, the first thing is we're coming up, we're in, we're in early February, is it's, you know, it's time, time to sign up for Little League Baseball. But we all know some kids are not ball and bat sport oriented. How can the LTAT be introduced to, say, a local town? You know, you, you live in the Philly area. How can that be introduced to the local town to maybe get more kids involved in movement activities who maybe aren't the baseball players, the basketball players, the football players, field hockey, et cetera? Well, that's a wonderful question, too, because there are a couple of components of different ways of looking at it. The way I choose to look at it in terms of LTAD is almost like who did not like recess when we were kids, right? Everybody loved to have recess, yet we still have an adult model that we impose on kids. If Little League Baseball is an excellent example because if you go back in time to see how Little League Baseball was formed, it was formed right here in Pennsylvania, halfway between where you and I are right now, Ben, and, and the, the guy who founded it had his uh, nephews come over to visit and he was really disappointed they didn't know how to play baseball. So it took him and his buddy a year to create baseball for the kids. So we always say, you know, kids aren't miniature adults, but how do they do it? What did they create? They had smaller balls, smaller bats, fewer innings, fewer games. They basically took the adult model, watered it down, and gave it to kids. So I think if we're really going to have um, impart some change in what's going on in society, we have to change the way we look at sports, ask kids more about how they would like to play. When I taught physical education, kids loved mat ball. Because you could run to first, or you could run to third, you could run all. So have lots of different movement options for actually moving. If you look at the amount of moderate to vigorous physical activity that most kids get playing baseball, it's probably pretty low on the list. You know, it's a, it's a leisure, all-American sport, largely because of how leisurely it is. So not to say there's not a high level of skill. There really is at a high level. But if I were to look at the youth model, because of LTAD having, like Tony had said, so many different experiences on so many different fields with so many different types of kids, so many types of movements, I'd create almost a field day experience where they would have three different areas to look at how you would institute what we look at as structured play, which means it's adult-led, which is what the sport is, and that's good. Kids need to have that guidance and supervision, but then some semi-structured play where the, we, we set the boundaries for the kids, and then the kids figure out how to do it. So maybe you give them a wiffle ball and a wiffle bat in an area and say, all right, come up with a game. What does it look like? How do you do it? And then just an area for free play and say, all right, here's the equipment. Have at it. You know, safety first, of course. But to be able to figure out how do we actually get kids excited about moving and looking at a baseball and a bat in a different way. And that allows us as movement specialists to really take a look at how they move. 
you know, a lot of times we look at the sports setting and it's really mechanical in terms of the expectation of what kids are doing. This sees them moving in their own environment and helps us to give them opportunities to learn how to move better. I think that's an interesting uh, idea, Rick. And I'm curious, how can it be uh, spread beyond, say, the NSCA and other organizations that are involved with that? Because when you were describing the three different potential areas of doing that, my initial thoughts were, that's something that you know a, a college physical education program or class could be heavily developed with having a probably what all of us remember when we were in, in school field day where there was a softball throw and a variety of other things. And then the second thing I'm thinking about is a lot of these townships in the area or, or uh, towns that have baseball leagues, basketball leagues, football leagues. Why don't they have field days for those kids who maybe just, you know, I just want to show up and try all these different activities. I know at the higher level, USA bobsledding often has trials or tryouts for maybe other athletes to show up. Can they be brakemen? There's all these kids, it sounds like, who maybe because they aren't good enough at one of these traditional sports, may be movers in a different way. So how can that be involved with people who are involved in the educational aspect and also people who are involved in the recreational aspect? Wouldn't that be fantastic? <laughs> a lot of different things would need to happen to see that, though. Uh, one of them, like you mentioned, with physical education would be to retrain how physical education looks at physical education. It's gotten uh, largely in, in some areas into looking solely at life, what they call lifetime fitness activities. But if you look at that particular paradigm, that, too, is an adult-focused construct that we've imparted on kids. So what we call a lifetime fitness activity is mostly sagittal plane movements, walking, jogging, skipping, hiking, you know, maybe riding a bike, swimming only for crawling, though. We don't want to do the other strokes because that might have a different plane of motion. The only lifetime fitness activity of multiple planes of motion is tennis. <laughs> and, you know, research is revealing that that actually uh, has a really strong effect on longevity, largely because it's done in groups. So there's a social element. You're moving in a lot of different directions and there's some tactics and strategies to think about. So while sports is so important throughout the life course, we're finding that sports is being minimized in a lot of schools. You know, it's one of the first things to get cut. Recess gets cut. Any chance for kids to actually be active during the school day gets cut. And that shows kids that we don't value movement. We value sitting still and doing what, you, what we want you to do rather than saying, how do we give you this opportunity? So that's that aspect of it. From coaching, uh, the U.S. needs to do a much better job in coaching education to show that there are a lot of different ways, especially at developmental levels. But, you know, I find I work with a bunch of high school kids too. They love to have fun and do something completely different because their days are so structured from 6.30 in the morning until 6.30 at night in most cases. So if they come in and I give them these opportunities to try stuff, they kind of look at me like, really, we can actually do this? I'm like, I hope you do. So it's really just getting everybody on the same page. And there's so many organizations who are looking at it from like overuse injuries we mentioned earlier. You know, if you're looking at it from a rehabilitative point of view, what a great way to reduce injuries to stop having to do the same drills every time they show up. <laughs> you know, baseball is a good example, right? It's time for batting practice, going to spend 20, you know, the, the, the workout plan is basically the same. All right, here's our fielding time. Here's our hitting time. Here's our throwing and strategy time. But they often do a lot of the same mechanical movement. So like you alluded to earlier, a lot of these kids are athletes in their sport. But if you move them outside of that particular movement pattern or setting, are they still athletic if they're only replicating six or seven movements most of the time you see them? It's interesting that you say that. A few years ago, I herniated a disc for the second time and realized that I was somebody who was involved in those sagittal plane movements, running, <laughs> biking. And now when I take my dogs out to the park, I spend the opportunity to do things like uh, stand up on guardrails and walk across guardrails. <laughs> and one of the things that, one of the things I, when I first did is I realized is like, wow, I'm really bad at this. My cardiovascular fitness is good. My musculoskeletal fitness is good. My balance sucks. Mm, wow. wow. And the more that I did it, the better I got. And then I, I also attribute the uh, sister podcast that I do, Fit Lab PGH. Uh, we interviewed somebody who is a marketing director for extreme pogo sticking, pogo sticks that are filled with air. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I interviewed this guy, it's like, I want a pogo stick. So I'm 52 years old. I turned 52 in November. And in November, I got an air-powered pogo stick 
that I pogo stick around inside the garage or in the driveway. I don't do tricks, but it's amazing how difficult it is, how different it is. And the biggest thing is how fun it is. So Tony, I want to direct this to you. All of these things you, you were saying are kind of things that I've found through the podcast as I interview people who are movers and involved in the movement field. It seems to be when they hit about the age of 35 or so, they're like, I just want to keep on moving. I'm, I may not PR in the bench press, or I may not squat my body weight or twice my body weight, or I may not be able to run a marathon as fast as I did when I was 20, but I just want to keep doing whatever the activity I do. And Rick, I'll, I'll give a shout out to you. I'll never do it, but I enjoy seeing the strongman posts on Facebook because you're not in the weight room. You're just lifting heavy things kind of like maybe you did if you grew up on a farm or just the big thing is you guys are looking like you're having fun. So Tony, how do you introduce this concept to the typical youth sport coach who's like, okay, I want to win the little league championship for my county, or I want my team to go on to the next level in basketball, or you know what, you need to choose whether you're going to play basketball or football because you're nine years old and it's time to specialize. Well, first of all, I'm very envious of the fact that you get to play on a pogo stick because that does sound <laughs> like a lot of fun. <laughs> But uh, to, to get to your question, yeah, it's, it's really that we're, we're waging war right now. I guess, you know, when you look at the things that um, Rick and, and Joe Eisenman and myself have been trying to do is, is we're, we're trying to, um, you know, we, we endorse physical activity in all shapes and forms. But I think a lot of times what we get away from is, is that fun element that, that Rick was talking about. And with fun comes passion. You know, if you're, if you're passionate about something and you really truly enjoy it for what it is, um, we know that we're going to participate or engage in that activity regularly. Um, I, I, can, I can only speak for myself. And I know Rick does his things with his strongman events. And, but I, I enjoy playing morning basketball with a group of guys that are well into their 50s and 60s. I still play handball. Some of those guys are getting into their 80s. Um, I enjoy skiing, but these are all things that came from my childhood background of playing multiple sports. I played little league baseball. I played little league soccer. I played pop Warner football. I, I did, you know, I did all these things. Um, and I think what, what coaches, youth coaches in particular have to understand is that it's really truly about the kid. You know, kids said this earlier, we don't ask the kids, you know, what do you want to do? What do you like to do? And we have to get back to that. Um, because it's, it's that element of giving them control of their movements and their lifestyle and what they want to do that's going to perpetuate as they become adults. Um, and, and so we, we just really have to do a better job of working with our national governing bodies, our community recreation, our youth sport clubs. Um, we, this is just something that we have to hit at all levels here in the United States and including physical education. Um, I think a lot of this you can contribute to the demise of physical education. We do not dedicate the resources, the time, the facilities to an important subject like physical education. If, if kids aren't learning how to move in school, where are they going to learn how to move? Um, so we've got a lot of work to do. So it's, it's not an easy task. Um, we are climbing a mountain, and um, but, but but this is kind of the, the central focus or idea, if you will, of what Rick and Joe and myself have been to try to do is getting multiple organizations all in the same all on the same page and getting the, the rows all moving in the same the, the oars all rowing in the same direction as Rick would say, and, and that's kind of where we're at right now. So we we have to do a better job. Bottom line of coaching education and uh, introducing them to the benefits of a long-term athletic development framework. And that's kind of where we're at right now. How do we get that into the grassroots level, the high school associations, the community recreation departments? Um, and, and, and I am a, you know, on my own part, my own behalf, I am a uh, program director for a youth lacrosse league in East Lansing, Michigan. So I'm getting my hands dirty every day talking about fundraising and coaching education and facilities and fields and equipment um, so that I can better understand that world and that perspective. So, um, there's a lot of work to be done, but hopefully, and with your help through these podcasts, we're kind of getting things to move in that direction. We're talking to Rick Howard and Dr. Tony Marino about the long-term athletic development uh, program. 
Tony, I'm interested in what you said a couple of minutes ago, the fact that you did a variety of sports growing up. I'm very similar with you in, with you, and that I did that. I like to say I'm a pseudo renaissance man. I excel at nothing, but I tried many things. I was fortunate enough, and I say that in all seriousness, to grow up in a rural area in a very small town where I was able to play multiple sports because they needed numbers, not necessarily good people. I'm curious, <laughs> did, did your background come from that, playing the variety of sports, or did it come because you were one of those gifted people who they said, hey, you know, you're a good football player. Want to try basketball too? Uh, not gifted. Uh, I grew up in the suburbs of, of Los Angeles in Southern California. So uh, we were exposed to a lot of things. You could surf, you could ski, you can motocross, you can play any number of youth sports. And uh, the great thing about Southern California is that it's always going to be 70 or 75 degrees every day. And you don't have to worry about rain or snow or all those other elements. But no, I'm kind of like you. I was the uh, middle child and I was, uh, they didn't pick me because of my exceptional athletic ability. They just needed numbers. Um, but I think in a sense, that's, that's kind of the great thing is uh, when you, you, you put in those situations, in different unique movement situations, you have to learn to uh, adapt. Um, and we, we talk about athletic or athleticism. Uh, everybody is an athlete. Uh, we can create environments or opportunities for people to be competent and confident and do them. So I, I was just one of those individuals uh, where very similar to you, you know, just they needed a body, but fortunately dependent on what the flavor of the day was, you know, was it foot, was it tackle football? Was it uh, over the line baseball? Was it soccer? It just depended on, on what the activity was that day. Rick, you mentioned it when we started the podcast that you're a facilitator and you like to bring people together. I, I'm curious, what kind of feedback do you get individually when you talk to various sport coaches? Do they say, well, that's all well and good that you're talking about this LTAD model, but you know, I'm a basketball coach or I'm a football coach or fill in your special coach, whatever your sport is. And, you know, I'm focused on getting these guys or these ladies ready for what it is. That's all well and good, but it doesn't really pertain to me. You know, I really appreciate that you asked that question because the answer is when you speak to individuals, they're all on board. The problem is, is getting the collective we to get on board to do it together. So when you when you talk to a basketball coach, he or she is going to say, you know, that really makes a whole lot of sense, but the parents don't want that. And if you talk to the parents, they'll say, well, that's a really great idea, but the coach wants to win the championship. So, you know, it depends on who you're talking to here. Everybody really likes this whole notion. Because, you know, we didn't say that we're wiping out competition and, and that we don't want to have elite level athletes. We certainly need that. And we want to make sure that the developmental pathways are set up so that whichever way kids need to go, we have the resources available for them to get in that direction. But we're saying is that not every athlete is going to be an elite athlete, nor does every athlete want to be. So there needs to be pathways for everybody to be successful. The problem that we have right now is that we can't, we're working on it now. It's, it's getting better. But for so long, if you think of why sports is so big in, in the United States, and if I remember the number right, is it 15 billion, 15 billion dollar industry in the United States? So, you know, what's the alternative? How do we keep the money machine going in our society, but still providing the opportunity for the kids that makes them happy? The parents have gotten to the point now where that's that's what they think happiness is for their kids if they're on a winning team. If you look at a lot of the work like that Amanda Visick did with her fun maps, if you look at some of that information, there's so many different domains in which kids have fun playing sports. We need to really look at all of those. And, and I think once people get educated and hear more of what's out there and recognize that it's a really balanced approach that we're looking at, we're not saying throw sports out. And we're not saying that focus only on elite sports. We're saying give everybody the opportunity. And like you said earlier, too, that's cradle to grave. One of the key things that we see that's missing is where's the parental involvement in sports with their kids? It's more than just dropping your kid off at the field. Are you actually active with your child? Do you have something set up as a role model going through the life course? Or do you see families and communities actually getting together to be physically active? And I don't see that very often where I am here. It's interesting you say that about family involvement. I'm, I'm recognizing that I was really gifted when I was playing baseball, not very well as a youth, I still remember my mom throwing me wiffle balls and my dad and my sister against my buddy and me playing wiffle ball in the summers where first base was a tree, second base was a sundial that was made of concrete, and third base was the picture window. So maybe not the safest, but a lot of movement. 
I'm okay. curious with this, Rick, how much blowback do you get from coaches or do you get coaches one-on-one -on -one who say, boy, I'd really like to do this, but I just can't. And then what's your response when they say, I can't do this because the parents are saying this or the other coaches are saying this or the league says we're a premier league? Well, you know, you don't get a whole lot of blowback per se, except for from those that you're trying to explain what it is and they're really not getting it. And so I need to do a better job of being able to explain this to somebody who's not really understanding what I'm trying to explain, because a lot of times they'll have it in their head that this is the way it's always been done. This is how I came in, you know, and you also have to remember in America, especially our, our level of coaching where we need to have it the most for kids which is mostly volunteers that, you know, somebody says, you know, if you don't sign up a coach, this team, your daughter's not playing this season. You're like, Oh my gosh, what will I do? You get the YouTube videos. You remember what it was like when you were coached, good or bad. And that's what you usually will put out there. So when somebody comes up and says, Hey, you know, I got a better idea how to do this. Sometimes you're already entrenched in that particular pattern, not because you, you select it necessarily, but that's, that's where you felt comfortable at that point in time. So it's almost getting people out of their comfort zone saying, gosh, here's a better way. It's a little bit, if you think about it, it takes a little bit more thought, a little bit more time to actually put this together than to just, like we said before, all right, hitting time, batting, you know, batting time, throwing time, catching time, go home time. So if you put everything in a nice, easy structure, that's simple for people to follow. And I think that's one of the reasons that we're struggling with the implementation here is because it gives everybody a palette to choose how you're going to paint your sports picture rather than saying, all right, here's your color by number, go at it. So I, I think and we noticed this in the physical education realm, too. It used to be that the people were excited to have a scope and sequence where you knew what the standards were, and then you figured out how you would apply them in your classroom. Now we do a lot of presentations, and we're hearing, what do I do Monday? I don't, I don't care about the other stuff. I just need to entertain the kids for another 40 minutes uh, every Monday. What do you have for me to do? So it, I think it's a different culture that we're in right now. And recognizing that, uh, I think Tony, Joe, and I are saying, you know what? We need to have something to give to people. Here, here is a boilerplate of what you can actually do to implement that. Here are some thoughts and ideas. So we're working on that right now. We're talking with Rick Howard and Dr. Tony Marino, two of the architects of long-term athletic development. Tony, I was interested. You said you're involved in the trenches, so to speak, with youth uh, lacrosse in East Lansing. And I know I do some personal training because I believe uh, as a practitioner, I should practice what I preach if I teach. I'm curious if they went to you with the Youth Lacrosse League in East Lansing and they said, you know, Tony, we've seen what you're doing professionally with long-term athletic development. We're turning it over to you. What are the two or three things that you would change of what we're doing right now? And I know I'm putting you on the spot. <laughs> if, if only it was that easy. <laughs> um, well, when I first went into it, like anything, the first year, you know, you have to get familiar with the culture. What are the culture of the coaches? What are the culture of the parents? What are the culture of the kids? So basically, you're just surveying uh, the situation as to, you know, what you have, what are your resources, what, what type of equipment, what kind of access uh, to, to fields do you have, those kinds of things. Um, but for me, and this is my third year, it's uh, the, the first audience that I had to, to get reign over or, or get control over were the, were the coaches, getting the coaches to buy into what the framework is, because that really has a big impact on how you construct your practices and how you're going to run them and your competitions and who's going to have the opportunity to participate and play and, and those kinds of things. So the first buy-in um, that I really had, that I did get some hesitance was from coaches. Um, half were in, half were out. And um, it, it took some time, it took me about a year to get all of the coaches on board and uh, simultaneously educating parents on what the long-term athletic development framework is and sharing with them at parent meetings and with our administrative board uh, what the framework is and, and looking things not as a um, short-term outcome, you know, what, what's everybody wants everything microwaved. They want fast food. And I'm telling them, you got to put it in the crock pot. It's going gonna, it's gonna to take some time um, because you do have those overzealous parents that want their son or their daughter to be on that elite U12 or elite U14 uh, teen team. So it takes time. And, uh, you know, the, the other aspect that you can look at these things is that there's talent identification and then there's talent development. And uh, a lot of times people are really into putting together a model, the talent identification model for quick success, um, but they don't have very good longitudinal results. 
um, with the Altad framework, particularly in a community recreation type of setting, um, talent, talent development using the Altad framework enables you to sustain a positive sport culture, um, both from a physical perspective, but also from a social, emotional, affective perspective. And uh, we're, we're kind of bearing some of the fruits of that. But to be honest with you, I'm in the middle of it. And um, hopefully we'll start to get some uh, fruit off the tree in the next two to three years. And I think what I do in my role as well is I try to communicate with the high school program as well and give them insight and direction to what we do so it benefits what they do. And so that's, again, that's implementing in a community uh, this long-term athletic development framework from third grade up into high school. So it's a work in progress and, and uh, I really enjoy doing it. It's one of the more fun and exciting things I look forward to doing uh, because it gives me the opportunity to, uh, like we've discussed, practice what it is I'm preaching. I'm curious, Rick, uh, Tony's talked about uh, kids going up to high school. Have you had the opportunity to talk to college coaches about this or personal trainers who work with adults beyond the college age? And what has been the response or the feedback from them? Yeah, that's a great point, too. Uh, like you, uh, Ben, I also still continue to do personal training. I, I work at the fitness center, so I have clients who are as young as eight, which I, you know, <laughs> I have feelings both ways about that. But, you know, if it's something and, and I've been able to create sparks with, with younger kids to really like exercising and then going on to do other things. So I'm OK with having somebody like a, just an eight year old all by himself or herself doing some training just to just to really see what it's like. And really, it's a confidence booster, I think, to get to that next level. Um, so personal trainers, I think they're all on board with this to find out how this works. They don't really have a conceptual framework for training different populations other than whatever sports model might be out there that, that they've looked at. But um, we've presented to the NSCA personal trainers annual meeting when they held that and talked to a lot of different trainers. And, and they're, all, they're largely on board with making this work because they're working in a much smaller group setting too, or either one-on-one -on -one or small groups. It's not like you have a whole team trying to figure out how you're going to coordinate an hour and a half to two hours worth of practice. The college side I find fascinating too, especially being at a college and I'm really fascinated by the opportunities that are coming my way, being a professor at a university. I'm getting calls now from local programs who want to either do an LTAD clinic or do their summer camps in an LTAD fashion in an effort to actually create an LTAD model by bringing the parents in, educating them, uh, collecting some data on pre and post what's actually working. Uh, throughout the NSCA, we actually did that last summer with a group of YMCAs out in Colorado, and it was very successful. You know, the parents weren't really sure what to expect, and we think that helped. You know, they didn't have these great expectations, and it really, like we mentioned earlier, it attracted a lot of the kids who were doing nothing. So, you know, it's like 25% of all kids don't play sports at all, yet 96 or so percent of all kids play video games. So, you know, what are how do we fix that? How do we get kids excited about both? You know, I don't think the video games is such a bad thing because they have a lot to teach us. We're just not listening. And that's another podcast right there, Rick. I know that there are some people <laughs> yeah. who say esports are a sport, and I don't know. I'm open to be convinced either way with that. Tony, yeah, I, <laughs> Tony, I'm I'm interested with. Uh, I know you work at a Division One school in academics. Have you had this conversation with any Division One strength coaches or performance coaches about the importance of long-term athletic development? I know I'm thinking of a number of former major college football players that I know or former professional players. And one of the comments that many of them who are on the more intelligent side say they can't wait till they retire when they can lose weight if they're in positions like offensive line, defensive line, linebacker. And I think I just saw uh, people in Pittsburgh will probably shoot me, but Joe Thomas, who is a longtime offensive lineman with the Cleveland uh, Browns, has lost 50 or 60 pounds since retiring two years ago. <laughs> I just, uh, ironically, I, I teach a course uh, called the Principles of Performance Enhancement, which is kind of like, a, uh, I guess, a strength and conditioning course. And I just uh, singled out a couple of football players this morning and explaining to them that they are part of the talent identification uh, model and the fact that they were recruited from high school, uh, yet our Division One institution had nothing to do with their athletic development uh, when they were a child up until their senior year of high school. So, um, yeah, that conversation does pop up um, with students in my classroom. 
um, because so many of them are curious or what are some of the things that they can do to get to the next level, whether it be professional or uh, coaching or whatever. Um, I have, have had conversations with our strength and conditioning staff. I've been here for 16 years. Uh, I think I've gone through five different strength and conditioning coaches, and that's because we've gone through five different football coaches. Um, but we've had the same football coach here now for the past uh, four or five years, and he's had some reasonable success um, given the type of program we're in. And um, we don't really have a lot to talk about uh, long-term athletic development. It's more so athletic development than it is long-term athletic development because, again, the window with which that they are with the athletes is uh, such small into all the stages associated with the framework. Um, but it is conversation I do have with my athletes and, and, and a principle and a framework that I really encourage and, and hope that my students embrace to take with them uh, when they go out there as physical therapists or as athletic trainers or as physical educators or personal trainers, um, that they can take this framework out there and, and see how important and valuable it is um, as this, this cradle to grave type of concept. But uh, yeah, we have conversations, but uh, they're really very narrow because of the window it is that, that, that their time is here at Eastern Michigan. And Rick, I'm interested with the conversations you've had too. I remember I did my doctoral degree at Auburn and I remember a, an athlete who his main goal in life was he had left the hood to play sports at that university. And this is his definition, not mine. And his goal was he wanted to get his degree in physical education and go back and work at the YMCA or the Boys and Girls Club because he recognized the benefits that playing that particular sport had done. He said, you know, basically, otherwise I would be a gangbanger. And now it's like I recognize that I've had phenomenal opportunities. Tony's at a Division One school. I know you're a Division Two school, but you've had the opportunity to be around Division Three too. I went to a Division Three school. Uh, I did my doctoral studies at Division One. I. I currently work at a Division Two. What have you noticed the same or different from what uh, Tony's commented at a Division uh, Two school where you're currently at, or interaction with people who are at Division Three? You know, it, it's interesting what I've been able to note because it, it's now a requirement at Division One that they have a strength and conditioning coach, which, you know, a lot of schools have had it, but unless it's required, it doesn't often happen. Uh, the same is now true of Division Two, although there are creative ways of incorporating that in the D2 school. And it's supposedly coming through the NCAA for Division Three, but it hasn't been completely enacted yet. So I think Tony brought up a great point uh, earlier, too. Strength and conditioning coaches aren't valued enough, largely because they're hired by the football coach. So our, our thought process, and there was an excellent uh, post the other day from Boyd Epley about what he was talking about in the strength and conditioning field that we really need to change. And one of those is who hires the strength coach? Because if you're hired by the football coach, then how are you actually able to work with all teams? And if the football coach is training philosophy is different from the university's training philosophy, the lacrosse coach's philosophy, you have, you have issues because you're not all on the same page. So I think the college environment could be a lot more unified by changing under whom the strength coach reports. Some people have said, well, it should be the athletic director. Well, athletic directors, I think, should all be part of that sports medicine team. We should all be meeting together, but it's an academic institution. Once it becomes part of the academic process, then you could have these conversations like Tony and I have in the classroom, but we're not having that as often with a group of coaches at the same time. You know, we keep banging on doors to make that happen. So I, I think if we could change that, we'd be able to make a lot more headway at all three different levels of college, which then trickles down to high school and even the youth level. Curious kind of to build on this first with you, Rick, and then Tony. Rick's at a Division II school. What do you find your Division II athletes who are in your classes when you talk about this long-term athletic development? What's their response? Do they say, hey, you know, I'm still going to make it. I still have a chance thinking of, you know, maybe women's basketball, men's basketball, men's football, the sports where there are professional opportunities and also soccer. You know, I, I don't think that at our institution we have that many students who are thinking they're going pro. <laughs> they're, they're really enjoying the experience that they're having, competing in athletics and representing the university. And Westchester has a fantastic academic and athletic program. The teams are doing remarkably well. The strength coach does a fantastic job. The athletic director is great, too. So I think in the classroom, 
the the biggest issue that we have is like those those barriers and silos we were talking about before because it's not so much that they're an athlete it's what their major is so if they're in our department in exercise science or kinesiology every school has a different term for it but the majority of our students are pre-physical therapy or pre-occupational therapy and they think they need to know absolutely nothing about strength and conditioning or exercise that's not what they're going to do so it's become and the the faculty there we've all done i think a fantastic job of educating students that you don't know where you're going to end up. And you know, I could tell my students, did I ever think that I'd be sitting here having this wonderful conversation this afternoon back when I was in college? No, I definitely did not think that. So, you know, it's kind of like, Tony, I wanted to go out to California when I was in college. <laughs> I didn't really care what I did <laughs> after I got there. So, you know, we, we come from all these different places. The students, I think, are really receptive to it. The more we talk about it in class, we actually had a conversation in one of my classes this morning about it. Uh, one of the things we talked about is like something we talked about earlier, a construct. You know, there's really little definition of so many terms that we have. So they're all open to so much interpretation as to what we actually think they are. So unless we come to some kind of an agreement within our institution or within our sports program, what we're going to call things. And that's one of the criticisms you hear from our our discipline in general, you know, you see somebody doing an exercise and six different people call that same exercise, six different things. So I, I think they're really excited about looking at LTAD. A lot of them are interested in working with kids. And so I find that fascinating, but even those who are looking in cardiac rehab, um, I think there's some opportunity for it there because how do they end up in cardiac rehab in the first place? You know, when you look at the exercise program design in some of those other situations, as we get older, those students are really interested in listening to what I have to say, even though they're athletes, because they know that at the end of their four or five years, they're going to have an opportunity to really affect change in the population they serve. And Tony, I'm interested with the same question for you. If you have athletes in your class, and I know Michigan State is a Big Ten school or Big 12 school, the fact that there are some athletes that you probably have in your class who have the potential to continue beyond Michigan State, what's the a response from the students or their their willingness to listen and, and talk about this versus, look, I just want to figure out, can I make the Olympics? Can I make it to the next level? Can I make some money at this before I have to join the, in air quotes, real world? Yeah, I think, you know, as a graduate of Michigan State, um, I, I, I know that the, uh, the talent pool, shall we say, or genetic pool, however you want to say, um, is is quite a bit more abundant in Michigan State. So yeah, you're going to have those conversations. At the, you know, a tremendous basketball program, pretty strong football program, but you know, out of the other sports too, you know, rowing and wrestling and things of that nature, you've had a number of athletes try to or attempt to pursue professional uh, careers. Um, the institution I'm at now, Eastern Michigan, uh, is very actually very much closer to Westchester. Um, despite the fact that we're in the Mid-American Conference, we are still primarily a teaching institution. And the um, vast majority of my students, uh, and there have been a couple that have actually gone on to the NFL. Um, I can't think of any that have gone on to the NBA or those types of ranks. Um, but we, we've had a few going to the NFL. But the, the, the vast majority of our conversations are what are they going to do in their professional careers, whether it be as a physician assistant, physical therapist, occupational therapist, physical educator, and um, so my conversations, you know, and, and one of the things that, I, that really, really, really need me to really talk about this Altad framework in the classroom setting is got, I wish I had kept tra track, but I, I have had a number of former students and, and, and students in the past that have gone on to pursue careers in the strength and conditioning discipline. Some of them work themselves up to being the head strength and conditioning coach, many of them as assistants, many as grad assistants. Uh, that's one component. And so they really get an in-depth understanding of uh, this process of talent development and their role uh, in that collegiate setting. Uh, the other half of that is I have a number of students that have gone on uh, to look at this as an entrepreneurial venture. They have opened up their own um, fitness facilities or personal training studios or started programs in communities. And it's always great to hear back from former students that are out there in the strength and conditioning field and, and those that have started their own business to uh, text me or email me some thanks or appreciation that, hey, uh, you know, I really appreciate, appreciate you um, talking about this topic in the classroom because I'm beginning to implement it now in my business. And this is helping me produce revenue. Or the conversations with the kids that are in the strength and conditioning realm, 
having conversations about their background and what it is that they're bringing into that college experience, into that, that training uh, experience in college. So um, whether they're going on to pursue a professional career or uh, as an athlete or a professional career as a strength coach or an entrepreneur, um, I think the framework fits everybody and it can be embraced in many multiple environments uh, and, and many practitioners and professionals. And so that's kind of what I go, go, go back to that to kind of justify why I feel that framework is necessary to discuss in the classroom. We're talking with Rick Howard and Tony Marino. They are heavily involved in the long-term athletic development uh, model. I know one of the goals of moving to live is to break down knowledge silos and introduce people to new things. And the other goal is to keep the podcast relatively short so people are willing to listen. So, Rick, I'm going to ask you and Tony a final question to get both of your insight. Rick, somebody comes to you and said, I've been reading these blog posts. I listened to that Moving to Live podcast. You know, just give it to me. Uh, I'm a personal trainer. Two or three points. What can I use or how can I use this development to help me in my practice and to get more people moving? Uh, the first thing would be to involve the kids in the process. So whatever it is, ask the kids what they like to do, find out what their interests are, and then develop those. Focus on that first, and that actually becomes your activity pyramid based on that to get the kids moving. Uh, the other thing would be to educate as many people as possible about the process. So if, uh, bring the parents in, let them know what you're doing and why. Show them what it is. Talk to the teachers in school and the coaches so they kind of get an understanding that you're not just working with kids just to do it just because that's your, your money maker that it's a real sense of purpose within the community. I think the more we get anybody who's involved in any of these disciplines talking to the other disciplines about what we're doing and why we're doing it, it's that aha movement. Because, you know, when you talk about sports specialization, you need to look at the volume too. How much overall activity are kids getting throughout the day? You know, if once you get talking to some of these other coaches and teachers, you might find out that these kids are seriously stressed and overtrained. I found that out with a bunch of fourth and fifth graders I was working with a couple of years ago, that they had two huge stressors. One was academics and two was sports participation to the point where the kids didn't even want, they had to try out for their field day at their school. That's how serious it had gotten. And they didn't even want to try out because it was such a tradition. It was a private school and it was such a tradition at this school for the parents to come and be involved about their favorite team when they went to school that had been totally lost. So I think Tony mentioned the other key thing too, number three would be fun. Whatever it is you need to be able to make it fun. Um, best definition I heard of fun was the balance between success and challenge. You know, if we give everybody a participation trophy, that's there's no challenge there, that's not fun. If they go 0 and 10, they don't get to play, there's no success there, that's not fun. But figure out what that balance is for kids so that they get a say in it, everybody knows what's going on, they know that it's child-centered and that that's the reason why we do it and that it's fun. And Tony, a slightly different question for you, since you mentioned that you've put yourself in the trenches specifically with lacrosse, youth lacrosse. If, if the uh, president of the lacrosse organization or a group of parents comes to you and says, you know, we'd like to do two or three things in 2020, 2021 to really work on developing this long-term athletic development cradle to grave, what are the two or three things that you think would have the most impact for all of the people involved? Well, uh, that was Rick's last point there. Fun. Fun is the most critical. Um, I, if, I, if I want more kids engaged in activity, whether it's lacrosse or ultimate frisbee or gymnastics or whatever it might be, it has to be fun because if it's fun, those kids are going to come back. Not only are those kids going to come back, they're going to tell their friends and their buddies, hey, we had a lot of fun. I try to start a lot of our lacrosse practices. I encourage our coaches, hey, play some form of tag or ultimate frisbee or um, – Air Force football, or it doesn't have to be lacrosse. Just go play. And just the fact those first 15 to 20 minutes, those kids go tell their buddies, their buddies just show up because, hey, it's fun and they want to be there. So for me, who's trying to get a, a program, because we're, we're a program that's about talent development, it's all about numbers. And, and to get numbers, you have to create a fun, inclusive environment. So to me, that's the most important thing. And to get that message across to, to parents and, and coaches uh, and to our board. So the second aspect, um, which is just as critical, is education. We, we have to do a better job of educating parents, 
Why, why are we using this framework? Why are we using this model? My kids here for lacrosse, why are they playing ultimate Frisbee? We have to educate them as to why. Same thing with coaches. Why am I wasting the first 15, 20 minutes of my practice playing freeze tag or tag? I don't, I don't understand. I don't, I don't get it. Well, because we're trying to work on their ability to work on some fundamental motor skills that will make them better lacrosse players to learn how to change direction, accelerate, decelerate. You can take that in, in multiple directions, but we have to take that information. The science is there. You know, Joe, Rick, and I, we have this discussion all the time. The science is there. It's been there for years. We have to take this science and we have to put it in a form or a dialogue that parents and volunteer youth coaches can understand at the grassroots level so they can implement it. So those are my two key things that I really, really try to do with my lacrosse league. We've been talking with Tony Marino and Rick Howard, two of the triad of the big facilitators of long-term athletic development. I think the take-home messages are cradle-to-grave movement, and the other thing is it's really obvious from both Rick and Tony's comments the fact that you need to involve multiple people involved in multiple aspects of the movement field. I I suspect that we could probably talk for another two or three hours. Uh, I really appreciate both of their taking the time to talk to us as well as not just saying this is what we do, but exposing us to the fact that it's not just academics, it's not just strength coaches, it's not just personal trainers, it's not just coaching education. It really is the breaking down of knowledge silos. So Rick, Tony, I want to thank you for taking time to Moving to Live. And I suspect I'll be asking you at some point in the future for a part two to talk about long-term athletic development, specifically the uh, 10 pillars that are very well known. But thank you, Ben, for giving uh, Rick and on behalf of Joe and myself this opportunity to to share something that all three of us are extremely, I think extremely is kind of a conservative word, right? I think we're we're very passionate about this and the youth sport culture. So we, we cannot thank you enough for giving us this opportunity. I completely agree with what Tony said, Ben. Thank you so much for uh, leading the charge here so that we all can move to live. Thanks for listening to the latest episode of Moving to Live. Make sure you check out the show notes for contact information for our latest guest, as well as links about all the things we talked about. Intro and exit music is Traveling Light by Jason Shaw. You can subscribe to Moving to Live on Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, and Google Play, and be notified about new episode releases. Have any questions, comments, or suggestions? Drop us an email, mov2liv at gmail.com. Connect with us on Twitter or Instagram, both underscore MOV number two LIV. Please tell your friends about Moving to Live. It's a go-to place for information for movement and exercise professionals and amateur aficionados who understand that movement is part of what makes your life complete. Until next week, keep on moving.